of the press isn't just important to democracy, it is democracy. We're here to hold elected leaders accountable. Yeah. This is the Conversations on the Green podcast. I'm Jane Whitney. When marriage equality became the law of the land, most Americans saw it as a happy ending to the struggle for LGBTQ rights. But under the Trump administration, LGBTQ protections have been stripped away in plain sight. Now fear abounds that a new Supreme Court could roll back hard-won rights, including same-sex marriage. Joining me on this episode to talk about the fight for LGBTQ equality, our former presidential candidate and author of the new book, Trust, America's Best Chance, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, Washington Post columnist and MSNBC analyst Jonathan Capehart, Congresswoman Sharice Davids, and Delegate to the Virginia State House Danica Rome. Our conversation was recorded live during a virtual town hall on October 11th, 2020. We are so grateful to all of you for being with us today. We're really excited about this show because all of you in your way are trailblazers. And before we start talking about the renewed struggle that we're probably going to see to make sure protections stay in place and that we fight for new ones, I wanna talk about your successes. And uh, Pete, I'm gonna start with you. To say that you are an overachiever would be an understatement because between Harvard, um, being at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, being a Navy Lieutenant in Afghanistan, a concert pianist, mayor of South Bend, the first openly gay presidential candidate. Um, you're just somebody that people look up to, admire, and are inspired by. You ran for, for president, and people would say, I love this guy. I love this guy. But is America ready for a gay president? So I want to ask you, how much of a role do you think that your sexual orientation played in the race? Well, first of all, thanks for hosting. And uh, I just want to say how honored I am to be with each of the extraordinary panelists that we have today. And uh, to answer your question, uh, you know, we didn't really have much of a, a playbook to go off of that, that would tell us what to expect. So all I knew was that uh, I had to come into this race as, as my real self. Uh, it was going to be too much work to try to be anything else. And I knew it was important to uh, own and, and celebrate uh, my identity, who I was, uh, my marriage, my, my amazing husband, uh, who I really enjoyed sharing with, uh, with the country and uh, having so many people fall in love with him the way I did. Uh, and at the same time, we couldn't allow... Uh, this to swallow or define a race that was designed to be uh, about everybody. Uh, and I think the, the thing that uh, even I couldn't have guessed was how the way I talked about my own search for belonging in, in my community and, and in my life uh, wound up helping us have a message about belonging that spoke to so many LGBTQ people in America, but also spoke to people who had a totally different experience, but some kind of parallel or or uh, related struggle. And uh, I think that was part of what made the campaign certainly so fulfilling for us and, uh, and hopefully as part of what made it possible for the campaign to touch so many people. Do you think if you hadn't been um, a gay man, it would have made a difference in terms of the outcome? I don't know. Uh, I, I guess uh, it would have been a, a different story to tell, but uh, it's, it's so much as, as a uh, uh, a wise mentor once told me so much in politics is outside of your control. And all you can really do is, is come into it uh, as, as who you are the best you can. And uh, uh, there will be, uh, I'll be wondering about some what ifs uh, for, for years, but uh, you only, uh, you only get to be one person. And, and that was the, uh, the kind of touchstone for, for me as we figured out how to navigate all this. Jason also, your husband just released a book, and in it he talks about the sort of skitzy nature of the campaign in terms of you getting death threats, presumably from people who don't necessarily approve of who you are. And then you came under scrutiny by some groups who said you weren't gay enough, and I'm quoting them. Um, again, you tried to be, as you've just said, your true self. Was that ever a big conflict for you? 
it can be frustrating sometimes to see that even within our community, some people seem to be intent on on policing the boundaries of, of what it was to be LGBTQ. But uh, I think when you've had the, the experience of coming out, uh, that's when you decide once and for all to shed the weight of the pressure of others on who you're supposed to be uh, and just be you. And so the last thing I was going to do after coming out uh, was try to conform to yet another set of, of outside expectations about exactly what I was supposed to be or what kind of gay person I was supposed to be. As Chastin puts it so well, if, if we were uh, if we were gay enough uh, for the people uh, who sent hate mail or came to protest us for, for being who we are, uh, then we ought to be gay enough for, for our own community, too. But at the end of the day, there's no right or wrong way uh, to be LGBTQ. We, we just are what we are and, and, and did learn a lot about um, uh, how people respond to that and, and how many people came to uh, maybe uh, a place they hadn't started in terms of their ab ability to accept and, and, and see us for who we are. Talk about the impact. Were you prepared for the impact that this outpouring of people saying, for the first time, I feel like I can be who I am. You have helped me get to a place where I can accept myself more. Um, I've been told that you just, wherever you went, I mean, you were overwhelmed with people saying, you're helping me. Were you prepared for that? It was amazing. And, and honestly, I, I wasn't. I, I knew that we would have some effect by, by stepping forward, but I didn't realize what it would mean to, to so many people in so many ways. I was just remembering uh, being in South Carolina and uh, uh, a high schooler saw me coming into a, an event venue and just, just immediately began to, to break down and, uh, uh, and then started sharing her story of, of her struggle with, with acceptance. Uh, in her family. Uh, and then there would be people my parents' age. I remember a guy coming up to me in an airport and um, beginning to tear up and he couldn't even get a word out and he didn't have to just by means of eye contact. We had an entire conversation about uh, uh, what I meant, what he wished might have been uh, possible uh, in another time and, and where we might be able to get from here. Um, and it wound up being, you know, on one hand, a responsibility that, that I knew uh, I and my campaign had to carry. And on the other hand, a kind of propulsion uh, that, that really reminded me, uh, even though, uh, again, we were running for everybody, uh, of the, the kind of effect um, that, that that could have. And it's one of the reasons I think it's so important uh, to have more out representation. I think by the, the math that the LGBTQ Victory Fund has done, uh, to really be sort of proportionally represented across America, we need something like 22,000 more candidates to step forward who are out at every level of state, local, federal government. And the, the more that happens, the more people do see themselves, uh, not only see themselves reflected uh, in institutions, but I think see themselves differently at home. The good news is, and I was going to use that 22,000 figure because it's so staggering to really bring it, bring the thing into perspective, you would have to have that many more LGBTQ elected officials. But the good news is you have so many more running this cycle and so many more have been elected. And on this panel, we have two other firsts in that regard. And Sharice Davids, who is the Congresswoman from Kansas's third district is joining us. And she is the first lesbian Native American to be elected to Congress. She came in during this historic 116th Congress, the blue wave. And um, I gotta tell you, Sharice, I mean, I know you're also, you have a law degree from Cornell. You uh, are a professional in the mixed martial arts. I have no idea what that means, but it sounds really impressive. And uh, you represent a district that I assume is not a hotbed of activism for LGBTQ people. So I want to know what your strategy was to win in Kansas. Well, that's a really great question. You know, first of all, um, I think that... Uh, you know, Pete, when he was talking about showing up, uh, being who you are and being authentic, I think is a huge piece of that. You know, I think that um, I had a lot of faith in the people here uh, in this district because of my own experience and because of the way that I've seen uh, progress happen in Kansas is that, you know, folks want to know that you're running for office to help our community, to help them, to help their families to help our public schools and help people get access to health care. And at the end of the day, I think that um, certainly there were folks who 
you know, maybe wondered about uh, what, what I, I got that question actually, you had asked about whether or not people were ready to elect someone who, and you can fill in the blank, uh, but I think the, the folks that people are wanting to elect are the ones who are showing up their authentic selves and are looking to be uh, the best public servant they possibly can be. Because you have a pretty relatable story in a lot of ways. You you were raised by your mother, who was was she in the army at the time in the military? Um, but she, but you you know you were a, a car hop at the Sonic Drive In. You were a bartender at the at the local Marriott. You were like a regular person, right? Um, yeah. But it, did it get in the way at all of your candidacy? I mean, was that an issue with during the run at all? You know, only in that there were times where I would be having conversations with folks and uh, I remember five or six different conversations I had where someone would say, I want you to win this race and I'm going to knock on doors for you, but I'm scared that people won't want to elect somebody who is out and part of the LGBTQ uh, plus community. And uh, the direction our conversation always went was that each one of us has so much power in our individual voices. And if, you know, if what we want is a government that's more reflective, that's more representative of the true experiences, lived experiences of the people in our community and across our country, that it just takes us raising our voices up to actually make that happen. And uh, that's what we saw, a groundswell of people who wanted to see first generation college students, people who went to community college, uh, folks who worked the entire time they were in school. I think that uh, that those things often just overrode any of the um, kind of concerns or uh, worries that people had. It's my understanding you're you're in line to be reelected in, in about a month. You're in good shape in your race, although we certainly never take anything for granted. Uh, and I'm sure you're working very, very hard. Have you at any point in your life really faced any discrimination because of your sexual orientation? Yeah, I mean, there have been, uh, there have been times where I have uh, certainly had to deal with, uh, with being treated a certain way or, um, you know, not having uh, full access to everything. Um, you know, I, I one time was uh, not able to access uh, housing in my workplace that came with a, it was a usual benefit because I was living and working in a very rural area. Um, and because it was a, a religious institution, I wasn't able to uh, get housing. So I had to go find a different, uh, a different route for housing. And I think that those are the kinds of things that folks often don't realize are still in place. Uh, I, at the beginning of the segment, you mentioned the the fight for LGBTQ plus rights and that uh, many people thought that when, uh, particularly outside of our community, thought that when uh, gay marriage was uh, found, uh, it was uh, it's unconstitutional to violate people's rights there, that that that, that was it. And, you know, right now I live in a state where I can be the representative for the third district in Kansas to the United States House. And can, I, I can also be turned down for an apartment uh, if I go uh, up the street and try to get an apartment. And I think that uh, these are the kinds of things that a lot of folks, uh, sometimes they don't realize that that kind of discrimination is still allowed. And uh, educating people, making sure that we're in the room when conversations about this kind of stuff are happening is really, really important. And uh, it's, it's probably one of the most um, impactful things about getting elected uh, in terms of my uh, feeling like the, the, the pride and honor of being part of the most diverse class ever elected to the United States Congress. Danica, you were also a first because you were the first openly transgender person to be elected to a state house in this country. And not only elected, but re-elected. You ran first in 2017, and then you ran again in 2019. And as we discussed before we went on the air, your margin was better the second time. But I want to talk about your first race because you ran against a 13-term incumbent, 
a man named Bob Marshall, who, by, who, who dubbed himself Virginia's chief homophobe. And he said that your gender was against God's laws, against nature. And you beat Bob Marshall. And I want to know how you beat Barb, Bob Marshall. How did you win? Well, um, like I said, you know, from right after the election, you know, we had, we knocked more doors, we made more phone calls, we sent out more postcards, we raised a lot more money, both um, inside the 13th district and from outside. And simply put, we got more votes. <laughs> and the reason that people, you know, were willing to vote for me is because they believed in the message and they believed, you know, in the fact that, you know, our volunteer hustle was so sincere in coming from people who genuinely believed in what we're doing. And, you know, one of the, the things that I was fo so focused on in that campaign were fixing Route 28, expanding Medicaid to 3,700 uninsured people. And by the way, as of last week, we've, uh, Medicaid expansion enrollment in the 13th district is now, at, I think it's like 3,643-ish or somewhere around there. So we're almost at uh, full enrollment or, or what our projection was, which is great. I ran on raising teacher pay, which we also got done. And, you know, I ran on making Virginia a more inclusive commonwealth. So no matter what you look like, where you come from, how you worship, if you do, or who you love, that you're welcome, celebrated, respected, and protected because of who you are, not despite it. And the fact that our Democratic majorities in the House and Senate this year in Virginia passed the Virginia Values Act, that really reflects that more inclusive commonwealth. You did a, a spot on CBS Morning News talking about pride and talking about your decision to run. And when you decide to run and you're being told that your gender identity is against God's laws of nature, I got to believe that has to hurt on some level. Or how do you deal with that barrage of hate and intolerance that comes at you? How do you deal with that? I raise a lot of money off of it. You have a long future ahead of you, Danica. Okay, um, but, but you also talk about how you allowed yourself to be vulnerable and how you allowed yourself to be seen for who you are. And the whole act of coming out for you, as you said, brought you the most important things in your life. So this had to be a process, and as they say these days, a journey for you. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, you know, even, you know, when I get asked about like, hey, when did you come out? It, the thing is, coming out was a 14 year long process from the time I first told anyone anything even related to being LGBTQ until I changed my byline from the newspaper I was writing for um, in 2015. So it was a long process. But I think maybe what a lot of the people who are on this call today, um, you know, have in common here is we understand what that internalized struggle is like. We understand what it means to have to come to terms, not necessarily just with who you are, but the expectations of who you're supposed to be set by other people, where the reality is when we're talking about ourselves and our lives, we should be living our truth. And I want people to just really understand that there, there can get, you can get to a point as, a, as an LGBTQ person in America, where you know that by coming out, whatever happens can be, can be scary. And especially for trans women of color, especially black trans women who have been, I mean, just the, the murder numbers are horrifying. And even in Puerto Rico for our for a Latina tra trans woman, where we've had six tra uh, trans women killed this year alone, coming out can be fatal. It's really scary for a lot of people. And at the same time, it can also be really hopeful for a lot of people too. And we have to sh you know tell both sides of that story. And for me in that, I knew that coming out and the active process of transitioning in terms of hormone replacement therapy, just to start with, was entering uncharted waters for me. It was, I didn't know what was gonna happen, but I also knew the, the path I was on was unsustainable. I couldn't keep living like that. And just feeling, you know, day after day after day, feeling like, you know, just gender dysphoria was, you know, taking that part of my life away. 
and I wouldn't let it win. So eventually I did something about it. I started seeing my psychologist in 2012. And the reason I talk about that, and I still see her to this day, is because we need to destigmatize mental health and let people know that that is just the same as going in for a checkup for anything else. And that if you've got stuff that you want to work out or need to work out, go take care of yourself. It's totally okay. And by doing that, I was able to come up with a plan. I was able to basically have a timeline and everything. And, you know, here I am now. And I can remember being 28 years old, being so scared of what would, you know, happen when people actually knew at large, even though a lot of people already did. And now at age 36, you know, two time elected, uh, you know, uh, state official, you know, I've got, you know, my partner, I've got my stepdaughter. Transitioning has allowed me to live the life that I have today. And I know when you asked Mayor Pete about whether, you know, could he have won, you know, or what difference did make, being gay make uh, for him in, you know, his presidential race, I tell people, like, look, make who you are your asset. Don't run away from it. Embrace it, you know, just be that authentic self. And for me, I never let being trans be a negative. Instead, I was like, well, let's turn into a positive, you know, let's let's, let's give some people some hope. want to turn at this point to our Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who is also uh, an analyst on television and has a podcast called Cape Up, Jonathan Capehart. Uh, Danica was just talking about that internalized struggle. When you, when you hear, hear her talk about that, is that something you relate to? Well, sure, because coming out it is a process, as, as Pete mentioned at the beginning of the conversation. Uh, but I've known that I was gay since I was 10 years old. The struggle was first understanding what was going on. And then the struggle was, well, how do I say something to my mother and my friends? And then the next struggle, but with a small S, is how do you, once you then come out to yourself and start coming out to people, how do you live your life as an LGBT Q person. Um, I think times, times they have changed. I mean, you know, the French saying, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Well, things are infinitely, I don't want to say infinitely, but they are much better today in 2020 than they were when I came out in the mid or in the late 90s, uh, just you know, after, well, in college. But there are still issues and struggles. I mean, Pete was on on the show with me and we were talking about the nomination of the, the Supreme Court justice nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, and the danger she poses and the Supreme Court poses to who we are as a people and to our respective marriages. We were able to get ma marry our husbands because of a Supreme Court decision. So um, for me now, the struggle has gone from understanding who I am and coming out to ensuring that the rights that I enjoy as a result of the Supreme Court expanding the, the, the definition of who we are as Americans, ensuring that that stays true and that stays the case. The one thing that gives, that gives me the most hope is that I believe the majority of the American people are there. The Amer majority of the American people see us, they hear us, they're understanding us better, and they, they see us as part of the larger American family. We wouldn't be talking about Danica Rome or Sharice Davids if that weren't the case. And what I love about both of them is that they were their authentic selves. When I came out in the late 90s, there was no way they could have run um, as out, open LGBT, LGBT people. And, you know, I loved Danica's response to you about, you know, the reaction to her in her district and how does she do it. Danica said, I raise money off it. What I love about her, her race and who she is, is that, and I remember the first time I met Danica, I, I asked her, wow, like you... How did you how did you do that? Like what? And she just said, like, why did your constituents um, come to you? Why did they vote for you? And she said, traffic and everything. Traffic, right. traffic everything about her campaign. Her opponent wanted to focus on her gender identity. But she was like, he right. can do that. 
I'm focusing on the problems that that you have. And so that's of all the struggles that we we have been through and that we're going through right now. The fact that we have a Pete Buttigieg, a Sharice Davis, a, a Danica Rome, and then the the countless other LGBT people who are out there who are in elected office, who are in positions of leadership and power, that that is we are a much better nation, much better nation for it. And no matter what the Supreme Court does and no matter what happens electorally, we will get through this tough time, this tough period that we're in. We are going to talk about the possible realignment or the, the realignment, I should say, of the Supreme Court in a minute. But I want to ask you about something because you uh, you got married three and a half years ago. You have a husband, Nick, and uh, reliable sources, the New York Times, report that <laughs> when it came to pro proposing, you had to have former uh, Obama advisor Valerie Jarrett kind of push you a little bit and nudge you into it. And then once you had proposed, uh, you actually wound up moving up the wedding. Why did you move up the wedding? Well, we moved up. Well, Valerie Jarrett uh, was the, the sitting senior advisor to the president when this went down, when she was pushing me um, constantly to get married. And we were planning on getting married in late 2017. But then Hillary Clinton lost the election. Donald Trump was president-elect. And in about four weeks, my we first we decided we wanted to move up the election because it was important to us to be married while Barack Obama was still president of the United States. Um, we didn't know what was going to happen in terms of the court or anything, but we just felt symbolically we wanted to be married in, under the presidency that helped to make our marriage possible. And so to you know round the circle. So we move up, move up the date to be married while Obama is still in the White House. But then the person who officiated our wedding was Eric Holder, who was attorney general of the United States and who was the attorney general who accepted the recommendation from one of his deputies, Tony West, to no longer have the federal government defend the so-called Defense of Marriage Act against litigation. It was that decision and that move that helped speed, speed the ball rolling in favor of marriage equality. So for us, moving up the date and having um, um, former Attorney General Eric Holder officiate our wedding, um, lots of symbolism, but I think we there was... There was no other way to do it. We had to move up the date. And having Eric perform the wedding was just icing on the cake. And you made him you made him cry, it's my understanding. I, or he did cry, I, sure I should did. say. You didn't make him cry. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to find out, because a minute ago you sounded like conservative writer Andrew Sullivan, who talks about the fact that every goal that was set out in his lifetime as a gay man to achieve equality he feels has been met. He doesn't see that, that there are any problems. I shouldn't say that. But, but the point is he's very satisfied with where LGBTQ rights are at this point in time. Uh, are you that satisfied, Jonathan? I think that's the first time that my name and Andrew Sullivan's name <laughs> have been mentioned in almost a complimentary fashion. Look, he is more than welcome to feel like he's satisfied um, with LGBTQ rights in this country. As I said in, in response to your first question, there, we are still fighting. As you know, the New York Times reported on the, in the first session of the Supreme Court when they came back for their new term, Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, apropos kind of of nothing, just put it out there that they thought that the Obergefell ruling needed to, was a, um, there was a problem that needed to be fixed. It needs to be so, fixed. It needs to be right. fixed. And so, what they and said. so and, right. And and so to me, uh, I'm not satisfied. Just and I wasn't sat and I wasn't satisfied even before that because of the election of Donald Trump. And let's not think that the only the be all and end all of LGBTQ equality is centered around marriage. 
I mean, we're focused on the Supreme Court because that's where our attention is right now. But President Trump, since his election, and I actually say, should say since his inauguration, has been chipping away at LGBT, LGBT rights since he was inaugurated. And so um, it's wonderful for Andrew Sullivan that he doesn't feel the effects of what the Trump administration is doing to our community. And I hope he is able to still feel that way. But for the rest of us who sit in, in their constant worry that one day we're going to wake up and find out that you know, the country that made us whole citizens, full citizens of this country has pulled the rug out from under us. I hope he never has to has to worry about having that fear at all. Pete, at this point, I want to turn to somebody who was an icon when he was alive, was a pioneer, Larry Kramer. Larry Kramer, two years before he died, two years ago, talked about, wrote an op-ed about the fact that because of the Trump administration and the direction in which things were going, he was predicting that the worst was yet to come for gays again. That was the headline. Now, you recently tweeted that um, there's a lot at stake going forward in the wake of what's happening with the Supreme Court. How, do you, how would you kind of position this? How would you frame where we are right now? Well, I think, as Jonathan said, it, there's a little bit of a, a challenge precisely because of the success of the movement in things like marriage equality and creating the impression that the struggle is over. And yet we see in so many ways uh, how much work there is to do both to defend the gains that have been made and uh, to advance toward actual full equality. Uh, you know, uh, one of the challenges that the Equality Act has faced, this is the proposed federal legislation that would uh, ensure that things like housing and employment discrimination and, uh, and so many other areas were, were truly equal for all LGBTQ Americans. Uh, part of the challenge that that effort has faced is a lot of Americans assume some of those protections are already there. There are a lot of people who don't even realize uh, the ways in which people can face, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the housing discrimination that, uh, that uh, Congresswoman Davis was talking about. Uh, a few moments ago. So I do think this is a very perilous time. There is no gain that cannot be reversed. And there's also a long way to go from where we stand right now. And we know it can get worse because the Trump era has unleashed or at least uh, resurfaced forms of, of, of bigotry and hatred and exclusion across so many dimensions over uh, national identity, race, religion, gender, you name it, that uh, again, many might have uh, uh, happily assumed uh, were a thing of the past. Um, the reality is there, there's no built-in guarantee uh, of progress. You have to defend it at every turn. And we're at grave risk, I think, as a country. After all, we're backsliding on some of the basic measures of human development that we might have thought we'd left behind decades or, or more than 100 years ago. Uh, the ability to control the spread of disease the likelihood of political violence. I mean, some really basic stuff that it turns out is not secure in the United States of America. So for a vulnerable community like the LGBTQ plus community, uh, things could absolutely get much worse, but it uh, doesn't mean that that's how it will go. Matter of fact, even the year 2020, which has been a year of anguish and chaos and pain, uh, I'm trying to remind everybody that the story of 2020 has not yet been fully written. And uh, the most in, important chapter in the story of 2020 uh, might be the one that's about to be written by voters. That was Mayor Pete Buttigieg, and you're listening to the Conversations on the Green podcast. We're going to take a brief break, and we'll have more conversation with our guests when we return, and questions from our virtual audience, too. Stay with us. You're listening to the Conversations on the Green podcast. I'm Jane Whitney. This conversation was recorded on October 11th, 2020, and our guests are Mayor Pete Buttigieg, columnist Jonathan Capehart, Congresswoman Sharice Davids, and Delegate to the Virginia State House, Danica Rome. In keeping with our town hall format, many of you have submitted uh, questions when you registered. We have video questions. You can call in. You can ask questions via the chat. I still don't know where the chat is, but I know it's there. And um, right now, we're going to start with a question that was actually asked by Henry James, who's a student here in Connecticut. But it was also asked by a question 
by a couple, excuse me, in South Carolina. Here it is. Hi, this is Missy and Bunny from South Carolina. Our state ranks 40th in the nation for providing equal rights to its LGBTQ community. We're not asking for special rights, just equal rights. What, what can, can we, we do, do to, to fix, fix this? Sharice, I'm going to come out to you on this one because as Pete just, just mentioned, I think there are 20 states that actually have protections in place against discrimination, but there are also 28 states that don't have uh, any kind of any protections in place. And yet there's this perception that, is, as Bunny and Missy just said, they're looking for special rights. How do you, how do you deal with that mentality? Well, it's a great question. So first of all, um, I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the cute video, um, that they sent in. Uh, I loved it. And second, so we have to first keep electing people from, uh, diverse backgrounds, people who are part of the LGBTQ plus community, but also folks who are willing to, uh, pass legislation and fight for, for good policy. That's going to ensure that we all have the same rights and responsibilities uh, under the law as anybody else. Uh, that includes LGBTQ plus folks. We have to make sure that we uh, get the Equality Act passed through the Senate. You know, the House passed it uh, this past year. It was one of the bills that I was most proud to be able to co-sponsor and vote yes on. Uh, the Equality Act would ensure that you can't be discriminated against whether we're talking about housing, education, health care, any of it, because nobody should be discriminated against. And I think that um, that starts first with flipping the Senate. I think that that's going to be uh, a big piece. Um, but at the end of the day, when we're talking about uh, federal level legislation, the Equality Act would be something that would help address that. Uh, and then at the same time, like you said, there's 28 states. Uh, there are elections happening all across uh, the country in state legislatures. And I think that who we, who we elect to our state legislatures or assemblies um, are just as important as who we send to the federal level. And I think that we've seen a real focus on um, increasing the diversity and uh, making sure that up and down the ballot, we've got folks who are running for office and that we're supporting those folks uh, so that we can have a more reflective uh, set of decision makers when we're talking about things like making sure that our young people know that they're important. And, you know, LGBTQ youth uh, got to see this year an entire body in the federal government, the United States House, said that it is not OK to discriminate against LGBTQ people, not in any arena, not at any time, not in this country. And I think that's a really important thing, particularly when. We talk about the uh, disproportionate uh, impacts of, um, of suicide amongst our youth. And I was really happy to hear Danica earlier talking about the ways that we need to address uh, and, and increase access to and destigmatize uh, mental and emotional health, because um, those are really important things. Danica, I do want to turn to you at this point because the trans, uh, the trans community seems, from what I what I researched at least, to be much in much more dire straits when it comes to discrimination, bullying. Uh, as you mentioned, it's a record this year. There have been, I believe, thirty one killings. Of that number, twenty six are Latinx, and is it Latinx? I think it's Latinx and African American. How, what are the special issues involved? Are there special issues involved with trying to protect trans, the trans population? Well, the first thing is acknowledging that the trans population is facing the problems that we are actually facing. Um, and for a lot of black and brown trans women and uh, Latinx, by the way, uh, for a lot of Latinx uh, trans women, your very basic presence in a room can get you killed. And as long as Eastern Avenue that straddles the line between the District of Columbia and Maryland continues to be a place where trans women are being killed just outside of you know, our nation's capital, then that means that we have to understand as a country just how fatal 
your basic existence can be because people will single you out, stigmatize you, dehumanize you, and treat you as anything less than an actual human being and an actual person. And that's why it's also incumbent upon LGBTQ elected officials, especially to be elevating the voices of the very people we should be fighting for in the first place, along with our constituents. We have to also remember that we all represent trans people too. And trans people are also our constituents. It doesn't matter whether you are a mayor in uh, South Bend, whether you're a congresswoman from Kansas, whether you're a state legislator from Virginia, you have to represent your constituents. You have to represent the people. And that includes the most vulnerable people of our populations. And for, you know, it, when you look at what we were able to accomplish in Virginia just this year, we passed my bill, HB 1429, that prohibits discrimination against trans people in health insurance. For anyone who is insured under a Virginia group plan, which is about 22% of health insurance uh, coverage. And we had to do that because we knew the Trump administration was about to gut the ACA's protection for trans people, and we were right. We also passed a bill this year to make sure that trans kids are actually, you know, treated okay and respected in schools. Because in Virginia, we've had horrible instances of discrimination against uh, trans young people. From a you know a young girl uh, named Morgan in Stafford County who was left alone outside of a uh, uh, locker room and outside of uh, restrooms at her school gym, left alone in a hallway during a lockdown drill as if to prepare for a gunfire event because the school officials didn't know how to humanely treat a trans girl because we didn't give good guidance to them. You know, you have a trans boy named James who, what, you know, over in West Point was, you know, being... He, his teacher wouldn't even use his pronoun, wouldn't even refer to him as who he is. And you had people trying to make the teacher into a martyr for it. I just cannot emphasize enough that unless you know what that lived experience is like, unless you have taken the time to put yourself in the shoes of someone who genuinely understands what it's like to struggle just to get through the night, let alone into the next morning, then it might be hard to understand if you, you know, live in a penthouse and you're completely disattached from the struggles of, you know, everyday people here who don't have access to all the greatest, you know, just items and services in the world. So many people are still struggling, which is why, you know, when you look at the data for LGBT, you know, for um, home, for young people who are experiencing homelessness, 40% of them identify as LGBTQ. When you look at su suicide attempt statistics, 41% of trans people will attempt suicide in their life, according to data from the Williams Institute. As you know, Delegate Mark Levine, who's out in the um, House of Delegates says, that's not the product of a society that loves us too much. At the same time, we also have to recognize that it's our job to make sure that we are being you know, in control of our destinies and that we are being our best advocates and that we are standing up and we are fighting for the very, very people who understand that day to day can be a struggle and that we are here to you know, give a hand out and our hand up so that we can you know, create more, a more equitable society. Jonathan, I wanna talk about, go back to the Supreme Court because uh, it's pretty clear that there's going to be a realignment on the court. And yet it is said that very often the Supreme Court, they're not oblivious to public opinion. They're not oblivious to what, what society, the direction society is taking in terms of civil rights struggles. Um, and for example, last, last June, Justice Gorsuch surprised everybody when he wrote a majority opinion uh, that basically brought LGBTQ people into the Civil Rights Act protections that would uh, make sure they weren't discriminated against in, in the workplace. And so everybody was like, oh my heavens, look at what happened with Justice Gorsuch. Now, going forward, and there are many things on the line, how much of a, a role do you think public opinion could play in decisions involving LGBTQ people? We're going to find out the answer to your question, uh, Jane, in real time. And I say that because if Judge Amy Coney Barrett is indeed confirmed to the Supreme Court, the conservative majority on the court will be six to three. And one of the things I think about is the fact that what I mean, what you say and what you point out about Justice Gorsuch, 
is true. It was surprising. And sometimes we are surprised by the justices on the court because of their lifetime, their lifetime appointment. They're supposedly free of politics. Um, they also are supposed to follow the law and interpret the law and not legislate from the bench. What's concerning about Judge Barrett is that in her past writings and even in interviews and speeches that she's given, she's made it pretty clear where she stands on a whole host of issues, whether it's the Obergefell ruling that um, made marriage equality the law of the land or Roe versus Wade, which is about a woman's right to choose, any number of issues, you know, I'm going to wait and see if she's going to surprise us and not go down the road that it looks like she's already well down the road. But the other thing that we have to keep in mind, Jane, is that, you know, the Supreme Court is is the top of the federal judiciary. But let's not forget that the, there are two things that Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell really cares about um, his majority and judges. And for this entire the entirety of President Trump's first term, he has done nothing but confirm judges. More than 200, I believe the latest, more than 230 federal judges have been confirmed. He has completed his goal of reshaping the federal judiciary. So even if, say, we have a Democratic president in the White House with a Democratic Senate majority and a Democratic House majority passing all sorts of laws, there's a federal judiciary that's going to be conservative, right-leaning, that could yank things all the way back with their rulings. So that is something to be mindful of. But can I just say something to Missy and Bunny in South Carolina? Sure, they'd Miss love that. So Missy, Bunny, you are in South Carolina and you are in the state with the hottest Senate race in the country. The most immediate thing you can do as South Carolinians is vote for Jamie Harrison, the Democratic Senate, can, Senate uh, the Democratic candidate for Senate, and tell every friend, neighbor, colleague that you have um, to vote for him. I think it was um, Congresswoman to, to Sharice's point: if if Democrats retake the Senate, in addition to holding on to the House, that is a Democratic congressional majority that can pass the laws, and with a Democrat in the White House, if Joe Joe Biden and Kamala Harris get elected, you would have a democratic control of Washington that can pass laws and enact laws that will protect us further. And so you actually have an opportunity to be a part of the wave that flips, actually flips a Senate seat from red to blue. You literally have the power in your hands. I think we're going to go to a caller right now. Cameron, can you hear us? Hi, Cameron. How are yes, you? I, hello, I'm good. Um, my question is for Mr. Good. Buttigieg. As someone who is looking to get into politics, how did you navigate the political intersection of being an openly LGBTQ Christian? Great question, Cameron. And, uh, you know, it, it was some. Are you able to hear me? It was something that, uh, you know, I didn't realize would be as central uh, an element of the campaign as I thought. There were two things about me and my, my worldview that, that I shared. Of course, I shared the fact that I was out, what it meant to me, how I came to the world as an LGBTQ person, what, what my marriage meant to me. And I talked about my faith, uh, mindful that when you're running for office, it's very important to be there for people of every religion and of no religion equally, but also believing that I ought to put my cards on the table about how I was formed, and also uh, in the spirit that it's really important right now to make it clear to voters of faith that God doesn't belong to a political party. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I've, I've uh, found over time, uh, uh, certainly somebody who has a uh, more progressive political approach uh, and, um, uh, and, and belongs to the Christian tradition and, um, and is also out, sometimes I felt like I was uh, uh, defending or answering for my uh, uh, LGBTQ identity in the context of, of the community of believers. Just as often, I felt like sometimes I was answering for uh, uh, for religion or answering for having a Christian Christian identity in a gay community or a progressive community that had come to know faith only through the lens of exclusion, through all of the ways in which faith 
had been used as a cudgel, used to hurt and used to exclude, uh, which to me so much flies in the face of what is best uh, about faith, about uh, certainly the, the faith that I subscribe to. Uh, I guess the best advice that, that I could give you is to wear who you are on your sleeve because you'll never know who it will resonate with. I couldn't believe how many people after I made some passing references to, to, to religion and to the importance of reclaiming religion from the idea that it belonged to one side of the aisle. Uh, there were almost as many people uh, telling me how much that meant to them and, and how appreciative they were of that side of the campaign as they were the, the historic nature of running as an out candidate. And uh, like so many um, intersections where people uh, might imagine that they're alone, just that first time they, they find out that they're not, get to speak to somebody who sees uh, uh, the world through similar eyes. Uh, others are, are empowered to come forward or just conversations uh, can happen. And, you know, there's, there's such, um, there's such terrible hurt, especially in families and communities where faith is very important because of the ways that it's uh, be, been uh, an excuse or, or a reason to exclude uh, queer people in particular. Um, but I also think there's so much room for healing uh, at, at a time when many can be maybe called to a better place on the issue of acceptance um, by thinking about the, the, the counsel of faith traditions that uh, call us to look after the marginalized and to see the humanity in one another uh, and to uh, look for, for love wherever we can find it. Uh, and in that, I think there's an opportunity for um, those living at, at that intersection to, live, uh, to, to help lead the way and maybe a real flourishing of out Christianity in the future. Unfortunately, though, in the last five years, the number of people who feel it's acceptable to discriminate based on, on religion has increased. And Sharice, I want to go back to you just for a clarification on the Equality Act, because you were part of passing that in the House back in the spring of 2019, and it still might go forward depending on what happens um, with the election. Does that not sort of knock out any kind of religious exemption that you can't discriminate, even if you have some some uh, objection based on your religion? Well, I think so. First of all, um, I think that a lot of folks recognize that you uh, are able to fully live your uh, your faith and um, practice your faith uh, while also not discriminating against or uh, uh, excluding other people. And I think really this is exactly what uh, Pete was just speaking to, which is the number of people who uh, recognize that we have got to move away from uh, thinking about uh, thinking about LGBTQ plus rights as being mutually exclusive. And uh, the Equality Act strikes that uh, balance. It makes sure that uh, folks are not discriminated against in, in any arena. And I think, um, you know, coming from Kansas, uh, we've seen a couple of the ways that uh, the, frankly, uh, state legislature here in Kansas has been able to use uh, that argument to try to uh, restrict uh, LGBTQ folks from uh, adopting and uh, fostering children. And I think no matter what circumstance we see this happening in, we know that uh, it's not okay in this country for us to be discriminating against a group of people. Um, and at the end of the day, I just think that uh, we have to do everything we can to, um, Jonathan, I was really glad you said it earlier. I was kind of beating around the bush about it, but uh, we, we have to uh, flip the Senate and, um, yeah, I think, I think uh, Jamie Harrison has a really great shot out there. So, On that note, I'm going to go back to Danica because um, Pristine Ty, I hope I got your name right, from Orlando, Florida, wrote in a question asking about a case that will be heard the day after the election by the Supreme Court. And it touches on what Sharice was just talking about, which is that it could affect hundreds of thousands of children and families headed by same-sex um, parents who would be discriminated against by religious organizations if they want to take in foster children. It's a case called Fulton versus Philadelphia. Uh, Danica, 
I mean, what do you think about that? Again, bringing religion into something that really has no place. So um, I spent 13 years in Catholic schools and, you know, from fourth grade all the way until I graduated college. And when I was in high school, you know, we had a quote from St. Francis of Sales that was written on the walls, which is be who you are and be that well. And I went to, you know, a college where, you know, we had the obelisk of St. Francis. We had, you know, you know we had, um, you know, St. Francis of Assisi in that case, whereas we had St. Francis of Sales for um, high school. And you think about what it means for the obelisk in high school and the Franciscans in, uh, in college. What we really had at its center on that is respecting people, of treating people with humanity, of wanting the best for other people and trying to find people who are disadvantaged, trying to find people who need help and actually legit offering help to people. How can you possibly look at a gay couple or look at any LGBTQ couple who is a, who are ready and able to raise a child in this world with, you know, love and open arms and tell them that someone else may or may not be better than them strictly because they're straight. Whereas the reality is we know that what makes parents parents is the love that they have for their children is their ability to raise someone who is just going to be a decent person in the world. And we can all think of straight parents who have done that well, and we can think of straight parents who haven't done it well. And the same goes for LGBTQ parents. Just because you're one or the other does not mean that you are inherently going to be good at parenting or bad at parenting. We have to just look at that as a very basic tenet. But at the same time, what I would say more specifically in this case here is that if you are taking tax tax dollars, if you were being funded by a state government, if you're being funded by a city government, if you're being funded by the federal government, at that point, you were entering into basically a contract with every taxpayer in America at that point. And LGBTQ people are also tax are also taxpayers. We should also be able to make sure that we have just as much access to social services as anyone else. And so this is one of the issues that we have here where we're talking about discrimination based on who we are. And what I would say is that we confronted some of these arguments in Virginia this year. And the fact of the matter is in Virginia, you know, our side prevailed. And what I would say to people just in general is no matter what happens with that Supreme Court case, especially if it goes down the way we think it would, you know, if there is a new, you know, 6-3 majority coming in basically, is that we have to take care of our business at the local level, at the state level where we have control. We have to pass the Equality Act. And by the way, we have to codify marriage equality as a matter of federal law, as opposed to just being found in the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. And so the bottom line that I would say here is when Mayor Pete earlier was talking about the number of elected officials we still need to reach you know, parity throughout the country, what we really need to recognize is the importance of LGBTQ people stepping up and being vulnerable enough to be visible by putting their name on a ballot in the first place, all at all levels of government, because that's really the only way that you're going to have that sort of change that we need. And I'm always reminded of a quote from one of my heroes, uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth, um, who I know um, Congresswoman Davids, you know, has worked, you know, ex- you know, uh, very well with. And Senator, um, what? Um, uh, I'm sorry. So, what um, sh- what, what um, Senator Baldwin said, um, Senator uh, Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin. One of the things that she said was, by being out as a lesbian when she was running for office, people saw an authenticity in her, and they saw that they were like. Well, if you're willing to tell this about yourself to us, if you're willing to share this part of your life with us, why shouldn't I trust you with everything else when we know how sensitive that is in the first place? And that's one of the reasons why I think LGBTQ people in general make for really good candidates more often than not is because of our honesty and our ability to, you know, be empathetic with people and to sympathize and to really work for an understanding that we are each other's keeper. I'm going to say it again. I hope you have a very long career in politics, Danica. Pete, 
I'm going to give you a video question, but before we go to that, I want to ask you, um, Donald Trump at one point commented on your marriage. He said he thought it was great that you were married, and he referred to marriage equality as settled law. How concerned are you about any kind of overturn happening with the new court? I'm very concerned. I mean, obviously, the uh, word of a guy like Donald Trump is not exactly something you want to uh, hang anything on when it's important to you. And uh, nothing is more important to me than uh, than my marriage. So I'm not going to have it uh, depend on the consistency, good faith and truthfulness of a guy like Donald Trump. Uh, as as the saying goes, uh, <laughs> look at what people do, not what they say. And in his case, the fact that uh, he seems to have nominated, by the way, not just to the uh, Supreme Court, but often to the federal bench, uh, people who are pretty hostile to these rights is a matter of major concern. I'm not a legal scholar. I'm not even a lawyer. So I don't know the ins and outs of uh, how uh, uh, procedurally vulnerable uh, something like marriage equality is. What I know is that, uh, as Jonathan mentioned, we've, we've had uh, uh, two justices in uh, uh, not very subtle terms, uh, write something that puts, seems to put it back on the table. Uh, and you know, many of the protections that we count on could be subject to a death by a thousand cuts if it becomes permissible to uh, engage in discrimination for anybody who remembers to use religion as an excuse when they do so, which seems to be the approach they're taking. You know, I, I was serving as mayor in Indiana when uh, Mike Pence unleashed the, the so-called Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, in our state, uh, uh, trying to pit uh, two very important freedoms against each other, freedom of religion and the freedom to live a life of your choosing for the LGBTQ community. Uh, things that I don't think have to be uh, intention as often as po some politicians want them to be, but uh, they certainly will be if we continue to see this this kind of uh, maximalist strategy. So I think that, uh, look, any gain in society and any gain in law uh, is only as secure as people's willingness to, uh, uh, to stand for it and defend it. Uh, you know, earlier today, I was doing an event with uh, 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 some folks in the UK. And I always thought it was striking that, you know, the UK is considered a constitutional country, a constitutional monarchy, uh, but their constitution is not written down. This is something that never made sense to me as an American because I thought the very definition of a constitution is it's where we wrote down the basics. That's what a constitution is. But they regard their constitution as something that's built up over the years through norms and customs uh, and conventions. The reason I mention it is that in this moment right now, with a president and a, a, certainly a Senate GOP who have no regard for custom or, or norms, we're beginning to learn just how much of our system, uh, our political system, even our legal system, depends on things like restraint. It depends on, on things like people uh, being willing to adhere to certain norms. And uh, a norm like the idea that something as important as a, a piece of settled case law uh, the advancement that happened in our country when marriage equality became the law of the land uh, is uh, one of those things that, that you can't uh, really uh, count on uh, unless uh, you see that it's being defended. I think it was the novelist Hilary Mantel who, who said that uh, laws are like spells. When you, when you write spells or laws, you're using words for their maximum power. Uh, and like spells, laws only work if people believe in them. I want to make a confession today. I've been tripping over my words a little bit because I'm so nervous about terminology. It's been a while since I have done a show about the LGBTQ community, and I was a little unclear about what was correct, what was accepted. And Pete, I want to go back to you because we have a video question that goes to that very subject right now. Hi, everyone. My name is Jack from Washington, Connecticut. As a gay man, even I find the naming of our communities with all the letters used to describe us, LGBTQIA, downright confusing. To use an analogy, if I want to take the train, I understand the word Amtrak. I don't need to know the name of each car that makes up the train. I'm concerned our message is lost in the noise of not having a single identity that we can all share. Thank you. <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's a great point, Jack. I think about the same thing too. It's just uh, uh, you know sometimes getting all the letters out can 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 take a moment, and I don't think any of us in this community feel like 
part of an acronym. We feel like a community, a family, uh, a very internally diverse and complicated family. And I've been interested to see the way that uh, the use of the word queer is, is becoming a kind of uh, uh, maybe a catch all that, that we can lean into that makes it a little quicker to bring together those experiences. But I also know that not everybody's on board with that, partly because of the way that that word has been used, uh, especially in, in prior years, but sometimes now too, uh, uh, to hurt. Uh, and also because uh, uh, there is, of course, such a difference between the different experiences uh, that make up uh, our community. Uh, you know, the the experience of a black trans woman is so different than than my own, for example. Uh, but I also know because we're we're part of a community that has certain things in common in terms of the patterns of exclusion that we faced, and even more importantly, in terms of the power of of alliance that that we now have. Uh, that, that there's something that binds us all together. Uh, so I, I don't have a ready solution for you, but I, I'm sympathetic to that that question. I also think we should we should uh, uh, get comfortable with a little discomfort as we're uh, exploring ways to talk about and organize uh, our activism and our recognition of one another, uh, because uh, uh, you know part of what's made uh, acceptance uh, possible for so many is when uh, the community has been able to welcome people who are. Uh, maybe stumbling a, a little bit on their way to the right side of history. And the last thing I would want to do is uh, push anybody back into the arms of those who would exclude um, by scolding them for not getting it quite right uh, if there's goodwill uh, and, and, and a desire to move in the right direction. I wish we could clone you. I'm going to go to, to Jonathan with the same question, essentially. So is it OK for me to say gay man? Is it OK? Do I have to say LGBTQ man? How what is what's the right form of, of addressing at this point? Well, I mean, if you're talking to me, you can say gay man. Um, th that is I fine. I can say gay man? Okay. Yes, because you're, you're speaking to me. Um, but when you're talking to the community um, broadly, you know what? I understand that it's cumbersome to, you know, go through the alphabet soup of all the letters LGBTQIA. But let me tell you something as a journalist. When I started in, in um, this business on the, on the newspaper side, I remember when it was just the gay community. Um, and then it became the gay and lesbian community. Then it flipped the lesbian and gay community. And I remember when, it, when um, the community settled on LGBT. And it was a, a, the, there were discussions at least on my editorial page, editorial page at the New York Daily News, about whether that was even, should we even go there? Should we just stick with gay community? Or do we just spell it all out? We started just spelling it all out on first reference, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and then later on, LGBT. But I have to tell you, at the Washington Post, now fast forward 20 something years, where without even a discussion, all of a sudden I start seeing in editorials, op-ed columns, even in my own columns where I just thought, well, I'ma just do it and see what they say. And I put LGBTQ, not a question, not an issue. And it's important because it is a matter of recognition. It's a matter of, hey, we see you, we know you are there, you, you have pushed for recognition and we are recognizing that you are part of this large community, that your letter means something. It is not a catch-all, it is not a throwaway, it is not um, something to placate. It is saying from the community that the, each individual letter when put together it, comp it comprises a community and we are proud of that and we are and we are standing with all of those letters and particularly i love the q because it tells people who might not identify with any of the other letters but who might be questioning questioning their sexuality or questioning their gender identity and if anything if there's anything about the lgbtq community it is a big tent it is open it is all embracing. So what I would say, I believe it was Jack, what I would say to Jack is, you know what, to Pete's point, just try to get comfortable being uncomfortable because that is what the community is, is telling all of us. And that's what the community is saying about how it wants to be viewed and addressed. 
Okay, we're running out of time at this point. And Sharice, we have two more video questions. I'm actually going to give you another one because when you're in the path of multiple forms of discrimination, the odds are you're going to get hit by both. And this question goes to that right now. Hi, I'm Claire from Park Slope, Brooklyn. When sex education is being taught in schools, LGBTQ students don't see themselves in the conversation. We don't see ourselves in the curriculum. What can we do about this? Well, we're going to jump ahead because we had another question racked up, but we have Claire who just asked about sex education. So would you, would you tackle that one for us? Yeah. And um, I actually, so I, I definitely want to talk about that. I also just want to kind of reiterate what Jonathan was saying about making sure that we are acknowledging uh, the various pieces of our communities because um, there are often times where invisibility in and of itself causes a ton of issues. And, um, you know, we, we can definitely uh, get comfortable with getting uncomfortable. Uh, I think it's better for us to actually um, try to figure out with each other how we want to be identified, how we want to talk about our community, the shared struggles, the differences in our struggles. And so I just, I think that's a really important thing and I appreciate uh, the comments that Jonathan made about that earlier. Um, you know what? This actually is a great segue, the concept of invisibility, the concept of wanting to be um, seen and understood. And then as a young person growing up and trying to understand ourselves, um, you know, I have, uh, I like Jonathan, <laughs> Um, you know, I came out in the late uh, 90s. I was uh, actually in high school when I came out. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think that, uh, of course, uh, because of how important our uh, reproductive rights are, access to health care, understanding, um, understanding ourselves, understanding our bodies, it's really important that folks feel comfortable uh, when they're uh, in school, when they're learning about our, our biology, um, particularly when we're talking about uh, sex ed in school, I think that um, you know this is the this is the place where uh, we really have to depend on, um, in a lot of ways, resourcing resourcing our educators, resourcing our school uh, school systems to make sure that our kids are comfortable, to make sure that they're really learning the things that they need to learn about uh, about our bodies and the way that they work. And, um, you know, I think I think that our in, our investment in uh, resourcing our schools and making sure that our educators are as trained as possible is uh, is a really key piece of that. I want to go back. Can, can we still see Juan's question? Is that possible at this point? Do they have that question? OK. Hi, I'm Juan Fonseca from Connecticut, and while I can hide my sexuality, I cannot hide my brown skin. How are you using intersectionality in your roles to help those that are the most marginalized within the LGBTQ plus community, such as black trans women? Thank you. Danica, would you take that, please? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to talk, uh, take that. And um, just to go back to one thing um, to answer Jack's question, um, uh, Delegate Mark Levine, who I mentioned before, he simply calls our community the rainbow community. It's all encompassing. It, it, it hits everyone. And, you know, as I've got my little, uh, you know, rainbow ribbon here to, you know, memorialize, you know, the people from Pulse Nightclub, um, I think it's just, that's a really, you know, easy catch all that uh, works for everyone. So LGBTQIA, rainbow, whatever works for you, happy to have it. So anyway, though, um, to talk about Juan's uh, question in terms of intersectionality, in terms of helping um, black, you know, black trans women, especially. When I talked earlier about we as elected officials using our platform to elevate the voices of people who have been historically disenfranchised, one of the examples that I just use on this is that when the president of the United States came to Jamestown, when we had our 400th, you know, um, you know, uh, I, I guess you want I would, I would frankly call it a memorial for the 400th, you know, a year that enslaved people from Africa arrived in Virginia against their will, you know, at Fort Monroe in 1619. Um, my guest that day um, was a black trans woman from Richmond. And 
the reason that, you know, I brought Aurora Hicks with me that day was I wanted, you know, when I knew I was going to get a lot of media coverage afterward, I wanted a black trans woman there from Virginia to be able to rebut the president of the United States on camera, to NPR, to print reporters, to everyone. And I wanted her voice to be elevated because I wanted people to hear what she had to say. When I had, you know, my bill, one of my bills this year, um, or one of my resolutions um, that we passed, uh, HJ 85, which establishes November 20th this year and every other uh, year as the Transgender Day of Remembrance here in Virginia, I've specifically named the black trans women who have been killed in Virginia in recent years because so often we don't not only don't recognize it when it happens, but so often the murders of black trans women and trans women of color in general are left unsolved. And I will always remember for all of my days when I was the news editor of the Montgomery County Sentinel in Maryland, six months um, after a young woman named Keanu Blakeney was viciously killed in Rockville. Her father calling me and crying into the phone, I miss my baby girl, I miss my baby girl. Violence against black trans women is not only something that I've heard about, it's something that I had to cover professionally. It's something that has happened to, you know, the greater trans community. And it's something that I bring to the House of Delegates floor when I'm giving speeches about or when I'm, you know, legislating or whatever it is I'm doing. I have to remember that we have incredible advocates who can speak for themselves. It's not my job to, you know, to, you know, speak for the lived experience of black trans women. It's my job to make sure that with the platform that I have, that I'm simply giving them the opportunity to share their stories. And, you know, we have uh, in in Richmond, there's an amazing trans woman uh, named uh, 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 Zakiya McKenzie, who actually runs Nations Foundation. And she invited me in on late night one night when we were in session uh, to come into uh, a nation's meeting where, you know, black trans women from all around Richmond were able to share their stories with me, which was just it, it was on the one hand, some of the stories are genuinely heartbreaking. And on the other hand, you also realize that as a legislator, you can do something. You can do something to help. And one of the things that came out of that and came out from some of the other you know, um, community gatherings that we had was the bill that we had this year had had been carried two previous years um, by former delegate Deborah Rodman um, regarding non-discrimination in trans health care. Well, we actually convened a panel and had black trans women telling their stories to these insurance people. And, you know, I remember this one uh, guy in a suit, he he stops the key as she's talking and he's like, "What, what what is a pumping party? He had never even understood the health, basic health care issues that so many black trans women go through in the first place. And so just being able to shine a light on the lived experience of what it means to be a black trans woman in America, I think that that does just enormous good to educate people who need to know, especially people who are in power, and to make sure that we're actually doing something constructive so it's not just falling on deaf ears. At this point... Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to kick off the wrap up, which has to do with two scenarios. What happens if Mr. Trump wins re-election, and what happens if Mr. Biden is elected going forward in the sense of LGBTQ rights? So no matter which candidate wins, um, the issues that we're talking about will still be on the table. Um, and in, in that regard, I'm thinking broadly about the, the, the cleavages and fissures within uh, American society, particularly as it, centers, as it centers around race. Obviously, if, if Donald Trump wins re-election, LGBT rights, civil rights, our very democracy um, will be in danger. And, and that's not hyperbole. That is just fact. Just looking at what we've been through the last few months, a reelected Donald Trump would justifiably feel emboldened. And the authoritarianism um, that we are seeing um, is just going to explode exponentially, primarily because um, the, the check and balance that we used to rely on 
is not really there. When Richard Nixon um, l resigned from the White House, it was because Republicans went to the White House and said, Mr. President, if you don't resign, you will be impeached and you'll be convicted. We do not have Republicans like that who will go to the White House and tell President Trump to cut it out and to defend the Constitution, which is well within their right. If Joe Biden does succeed in becoming the next president of the United States, again, those fissures and divides in society will still be there. But the thing that we would have in a President Biden is a president of the United States who returns moral authority to the Oval Office, who in tone and demeanor and policies would be about governing the entire nation, looking out for the, for the least of these, protecting people's rights. And, you know, the court cases in front of the Supreme Court, especially if there's a 6-3 conservative majority, um, will, will still be there and we will still have some tough times. But if you have a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a pre Democratic president in the White House, legislative, legislatively, you would have a president of the United States pushing hard to, in, to be a backstop to some of the damage that could come out of the courts at the lower level and certainly at the Supreme Court level. But I remain, I remain hopeful that the election will go the way in which I would like for it to go, because if that happens to me, Yes, this election is between President Trump and, and former Vice President Biden. But what this election also is, is another choice. It's a choice between American democracy and white supremacy. And it is my fervent hope that the national polls that we're seeing and that this, the battleground state polls that we're seeing where Vice President Biden is leading, that they are true and correct and that they turn out to be that they turn out to be right because then that says to me that the America I grew up in that the the America I was taught taught to love and that I do love is choosing to side with me and fellow Americans who care about the constitution and turning their back on the last 4 years which have been a total uh insult to who we are as a people Sharice, you've been nicknamed the fighter for, I'm sure, a variety of reasons. But in the instance that things don't go the way Jonathan just blocked out, you are still left with the fact that you have many grassroots groups, resistance groups, uh, state houses, other, other avenues of legislation. What would you say to people who are really that worried that you're going to see a total upheaval when it comes to LGBTQ rights? Well, I think first of all, uh, we have the chance right now to put uh, any worry or fear or concern that we have into action for the next uh, 23 days, I think it is. Um, and uh, I, I didn't know that that was my nickname, um, but here's the deal. We always have the opportunity to fight for what's right. And sometimes it can feel overwhelming. Sometimes it can feel um, harder than anything we've ever had to deal with before. But we, we can navigate this. We can do well in November. We can keep pushing for progress. Uh, you know, as I'm so proud to be one of the first two Native American women ever to serve in Congress, um, one, the first out uh, person in the federal delegation from Kansas, uh, if people weren't continuing to fight for so long, I wouldn't be here. And I certainly wouldn't be in the United States House of Representatives. We have so, we, I say, I am also optimistic. I'm hopeful, uh, but I also am realistic. It's going to take a ton of work. It always will. And I know I'm here to do that work. And I know the other folks that are on here today with me are, are also here to do that work. Pete, I'm going to give you the last word. You wrote a coming out letter, I think it was back in 2015, and you talked about the fact you wanted to get married and you wanted to have children. And one day you wanted to have those children be very puzzled about why it would even be newsworthy that your sexual orientation was talked about. How far away are we from that point? The answer to that question is up to us.
culturally, socially, politically, uh, we have decisions to make about whether we're going to move this country toward that direction of accepting and celebrating who people are uh, or allow it to sit still or worse, fall back in some of the terms that, uh, that were just eloquently described uh, as Jonathan was talking about how stark the choice is that, that's in front of us. Of course, this is bigger than an election. Uh, no one election put America where it is today. Um, and want, no one election is going to get us out of it either. But what we know is that uh, elections are perhaps our moment of maximum individual power as citizens. Uh, and so if we can begin with a statement that we choose a politics of belonging and healing over one of cruelty and division, uh, that's a pretty good piece of groundwork for what I think will be the work of our generations, uh, the generations now living which is to see to it that on our watch, in our lifetimes, America, in fact, becomes the kind of place where uh, acceptance and uh, pluralism and, and welcome and belonging are the norm. And we have to explain to children why it was ever any other way, uh, rather than continuing to hold out the promise and hope that they uh, will somehow uh, succeed where we've come up short. This is our chance. Uh, and it's a historic chance. Uh, I'm hoping that what I've come to think of as the deciding decade for America, the 2020s, uh, is one that we'll point to as the one that made the difference in the right way. We are out of time. I, I just want to thank everybody, the guests, for their compassion, for their humanity, for their, for their leadership, for their service. And we wish you all the very best. And I want to give a very big special thanks to Pride in the Hills, the group that helped us produce this show today. They were helpful beyond description. So thank you out there for that. We also want to thank you for joining us. If you're worried about this tumultuous chapter that we're living through, if you're worried about the soul of America, you cannot miss the season finale of this show. Joining us will be Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian John Meacham to talk about how history's lessons can help us get through this incredibly challenging time. It'll be kind of like group therapy, maybe. Our live virtual town hall will take place on October 25th, and you can learn more and register to join at conversationsonthegreen.com. The Conversations on the Green podcast is a partnership with Connecticut Public Radio. Our producer is Jay Holt.